Let's now imagine that a crankcase explosion has occurred. We want to mitigate the effects of such an explosion, so we will use a crankcase explosion relief valve, or a series of them, and they will be installed on this side of the engine. Obviously they can also go on the other side as well, it makes no difference, it's just that on this side we're using these access doors to get into the engine, whereas over here we have our crankcase explosion relief valves. Serves are safety devices fitted to an engine. They are non-return valves. They allow flow out of the crankcase, but not into the crankcase. Let's take a look at one in detail. Here's the side of our engine again. Now we've got a detailed model of a serve. If we take a cross section, you can see there's our ladders again for climbing in the crankcase. Here is our serve. Let's just take the cover off. And now we can see into the valve. What have we got? We've got a spring. One large single spring. We've got a disc. That's this thin metal plate. Sometimes it's called a plate, sometimes it's called a disc. In valve terminology, you would call it a disc. The valve disc presses against an O-ring in order to seal, but it also presses against the valve seat, which is this area here, where my mouse is, and over here. The disc presses on the seat to get a rough seal, but it is the O-ring that gives it a proper seal. The spring holds the valve closed, the disc against the seat, during normal operation. You can see that the serve is mounted to the side of the engine. For large engines, we have one serve per cylinder. Smaller engines, they may have one serve for the entire crankcase. It really does depend on the design. There's also legislation and rules saying that you can't have two engine crankcases joined together, at least not in the maritime world for big engines, because that's just too dangerous. There's always got to be some sort of separation or segregation between two separate engines that may be installed in a single line. Aside from those parts, we also have a flame arrester. The flame arrester creates a torturous flow path. It's going to be created from thin metal plates or a thin wire gauze. And it's called a flame arrester because when we get an explosion, we get a flame or a flame front. And as it travels through our flame arrester, this flame front is cooled, it's extinguished, which prevents it reaching the outside of the engine. Quite important because it protects personnel and also other things that may be surrounding the engine. Perhaps somebody's left a bucket of oily rags here. If a flame suddenly shot out from the engine, it would ignite that bucket of oily rags. Oily rags should be stored in a metal container, a metal bin with a metal lid. However, I have worked on a few boats and this isn't always the case. Oily rags are chucked in a paint bucket, an open plastic paint bucket. They get hot. Sometimes you'll use alcohol as well for cleaning things. That also gets hot and can in some cases spontaneously combust. But let's stay on track. We've prevented the flames coming out of the crankcase. Now we have to deal with the large pressure wave that's generated when we have a crankcase explosion in this area. Crankcase explosion occurs, we get a large increase in pressure, we get a large increase in temperature, and this pressure is going to overcome the spring pressure of the valve. It's then going to open. I'll back that up so we can see it again. We get our explosion, the pressure increases, the temperature increases, we have a flame front, or a lot of flames, just to keep it simple. The pressure acts on the valve disc. The valve disc has a large diameter, you can see here. That's indicating to me that we can have a relatively low pressure to open this valve. If you have a large diameter valve, it's going to actuate at a lower pressure. If you had a much smaller diameter valve, it's most likely being designed to operate at higher pressures. Keep that in mind when you're looking at valves. Ask yourself, how big is the valve disc? Is that indicative of the pressure at which it operates? In this case, it is. The increase in pressure acts upon our valve disc. The valve spring is compressed, and that allows the flames and the increase in pressure to pass out through 
our flame arrestor. As soon as this valve is open, the pressure within the crankcase is going to drop rapidly. Not only that, we've got multiple valves, one per cylinder, at least on this engine. If we prevent overpressurization of the crankcase, that's a very good thing because it stops our crankcase from rupturing. We're not going to cause damage to the crankshaft, to the connecting rod, to the piston rod, piston rings, or anything like that. Remember the pressure wave that travels through the engine may cause misalignment, and that's what could damage a lot of our main engine parts. We've relieved the pressure within the crankcase. Now we can use the flame arrester to arrest or stop those flames exiting the crankcase. And finally, after the explosion, there's going to be a negative pressure within the crankcase. That means the air would be drawn back into the crankcase unless this valve closes again. Remember that crankcase explosion relief valves are one-way valves, also known as non-return valves, also known as check valves, all the same thing. They allow flow in only one direction. So when the pressure reduces, the valve will close, the spring pressure will press the disc against the seat and the o-ring, the valve closes, and we prevent air being drawn into the crankcase. Why is that important? It is mega important. When we had our first explosion within the crankcase, we call that a primary explosion. If air is allowed to re-enter the crankcase after the initial primary explosion, we will get a secondary explosion. The secondary explosion is worse than the primary explosion, almost always. So for this reason, it's imperative that we seal the crankcase as quickly as possible, immediately after the excess pressure has been relieved. Let's switch to another designer valve. I just want to show you a slight difference here. Notice here the flame arrester is within the crankcase. This flame arrester is oil saturated. Remember there's a lot of lubrication oil splashing around within the crankcase. It's saturated in oil and this oil can be used to cool down the flames even more as they pass through the flame arrester. The torturous flow path means that the flame is cooled down and it finds it quite difficult to pass through the flame arrester. We use these torturous flow paths all over the place, especially in steam systems. But after the flame arrester, you'll see we've got a disc, we've got an O-ring, we've got a valve seat, and we have a spring. There's no valve spindle because it's not required. And the thing that is interesting on this valve, which was not present on the other, is this 120 degree opening. If I take a cross section, we can see it a bit better. Over here, let's just remove the spring a second. There you go, you can see the opening going straight down. It's 120 degrees, that's the 120 degree arc from here going across to here. The reason it points downwards is because if there's personnel nearby, we can direct the pressure wave, maybe even the flames if any manage to get past the flame arrester, downwards, and that protects personnel. See here at the top, it's totally sealed. It's just the bottom where we get the pressure wave and potentially the flames, which we hope we won't have after the flame arrester, but may still be there. All of that will be pointed downwards. That piece is called a deflector and it is a safety part of the valve. Not all valves have them, as you can see here. Put the cover back on. This one does not have a deflector. Hopefully you now understand what a crankcase explosion relief valve is what the main parts are and how it works. If you want to use any of the 3D models shown in this video, then head on over to savory.com. We've got over 400 engineering 3D models that you can use directly through a web browser in AR or VR. If you want to learn more about engineering, we've got over 45 hours of engineering video tutorials and courses at savory.com. And you can learn about valves, pumps, power stations, electrical transformers, and many other common engineering machines and processes. Before you go, don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Thank you very much for your time.